lecture this uh, this afternoon. Um, we're about halfway through the revision series now, um, and this is the first one that I've done for you guys since last year. Um, so I've sort of wanted to change it a bit from last year. I feel like you guys have, you know, you've moved on, you're 50 years now, you're a bit more experienced, and I sort of want to move away from these um, really heavy sort of revision slides and sort of just reading them off to you. I feel like um, it's just a waste of my time, a waste of your time. You know, there's so many good resources out there. I said last year, you know, I basically just use the PassMed and QuesMed textbooks. Um, so what I've sort of done, oh, did someone else take control there? Ed? It wasn't me, I'll put the slides back up though. Ed? Oh. Sorry about that, don't know what happened there. Um, cheers Ed, thank you. Um, sorry, so basically yeah, what I was saying is I sort of moved away from these um, revision heavy slides and I've basically made this presentation into a, a more clinical cases based thing. So instead of just working through like your uh, presentation, symptoms, etc., I've made it into a clinical case sort of scenario. And I'm going to ask you guys questions. So I'd like you to sort of um, answer uh, the questions on the VVOX chat um, and we'll work through them together. This will help you prepare more for your OSCE as well, because obviously you guys can get to and I think taking time off from Oski last year was a big to me. I found finals a lot harder and I've tried to make these clinical cases similar to the level and the sort of questions and things you'd sort of come across in your OSCE. And um, basically I've tried to throw in more SBAs as well to, to emphasise learning points. And um, I've tried to tailor them as much as possible to what I can remember from the exams. So basically, I'm trying to make it better for you guys. I've done this for the fourth years once already and got quite a good uh, response. Uh, but please let me know in the feedback forms whether you'd prefer the old format because I can do that moving forward. But anyway, so I want to spend 10 minutes on each case and there'll be two or three SBAs for each one. Um, so basically, this is what I'm going to go over today. So for urology, these, these surgical specialties in fifth year, it can be quite um, tricky to sort of get, you know, understand what you need to know, what, what's best for you to learn. So as it is, it's like a specialty year. So you don't really need to know too much, just very sort of basic level and just know how to handle the emergencies. So I've tried to cover that in all these cases here. These are probably the most common things that you'll get asked about. Um, and then at the end, I'll go through like niche SBAs and UCL SBAs that I can remember that were quite tough. Um, one thing I will say is I can't really remember there being any hard urology SBAs, so that's probably good for you guys. So we'll start with the first case, which is about testicular disorders. Um, Chris, could could you start the urology VVOX? Because I probably have a few questions for these guys. The first SBA is coming up now. If you could just close the poll, Chris, when there's been a decent number of responses, that'd be great. Yeah. OK, brilliant. So this uh, uh, this question came up in, I think, both fifth year and finals. Um, so this is something that you guys need to recognise. It's a urological emergency. 
this patient has um, testicular torsion. Um, I'm sure you're aware of how it presents. Uh, the absent cremaster reflex as well gives it away. Um, but basically just talking through the, the answers. So um, urgent testicular ultrasound. So this is something that you should be recognising clinically. Um, and you need to just get them arranged to have surgical exploration to save the testicle, basically. Um, I, I do think I remember one of our questions being a bit ambiguous. Um, ideally, all testicular lumps would or masses would get ultrasound. Um, but when you know if it's bound or testicular torsion, you just go straight for that urgent uh, surgical exploration. Um, bleep the on-call urologist is something that you would do, but you should be able to recognise this on your own first. Um, prescribed analgesia and outpatient follow-up. If it was um, colic, like a renal stone, this would be acceptable if it was small, um, but obviously not for this. It's a different presentation. And basically, yeah, the fifth one's wrong because you just can't delay the surgery. It's got to be done straight away. So we'll move on to the first case. So a 27 year old man presents to his GP. Also, yeah, um, a lot of the surgical specialties, they can throw that in with GP as well, especially this sort of stuff. Um, so they, they can ask questions about it uh, in that way. Uh, so basically, yeah, a 27 year old man. Um, um, oh, the early question. Yeah, and like urethral strictures, stuff like that is what I won't be talking about. I don't think it comes up very much. Um, okay. So it's interesting your mind, since his GP is concerned about a change in his left testicle. So you sort of have to approach this quite broadly. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. It could be a cancer, it could be a simple cyst, and it's quite important that you know how the, the sort of classic things like variceal and hydroseal present. Um, the management is all quite similar for your sort of level. But as I say, it's a very common presenting complaint. Um, in an OSCE, you know, the patient could present and, you know, they can be quite concerned, embarrassed. It's one of these things that you'll have to use, um, you know, your communication skills for. And as I've mentioned, it could be nothing, but it could be a testicular cancer. So it's quite important. So the history of presenting complaint. So um, this patient noticed the lump in his uh, left testicle a few days ago. Uh, he's noticed the difference, um, but he's unsure how long it's been there. He can feel a hard mass and it feels like it's part of the testicle. There's no pain. There's no redness or diffuse swelling, no fevers. Uh, he's not sexually active and there's no pain or blood. So judging from this, this seems to be something quite sinister. Um, redness or diffuse swelling would suggest sort of a orchitis sort of picture. Um, and the fact that it's like a hard mass and it's felt inside uh, part of the testicle would sort of rule out your sort of, you know, your hydrocele because that's something that's quite large and quite soft. Um, so his past medical history, asthma, crypto orchidism is something to be aware of. Um, that can increase the risk of um, uh, testicular cancer. So, yeah, this could be an epididymal cyst. Um, it's quite hard to tell clinically uh, between those two. I'm going to get onto that later. Uh, family history. So father died of bladder cancer, age 63. Drug history, just his asthma medication. Doesn't take any over the counter medications and no known allergies. Uh, he's currently working as a store manager, lives with his girlfriend. Um, he smokes, he drinks occasionally. And then ice is quite important as well. Um, in our OSCE, we, took, we had to take a history and the patient was quite concerned about cancer in that one. So these are things that you should be thinking about and understanding how to explain them. Um, so he's not too worried because he think because the lump isn't painful and a painless mass in a, a gentleman of this age um, could be cancer or assist as this pair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've just realised I wrote that about the girlfriend. OK, so on examination, um, these are sort of classical uh, images that they could use. I don't know. I don't think um, you might not get a testicular examination in your OSCE, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, so the first one, does anyone know what that's trying to show, trying to demonstrate? Yeah, variceal nice. So it's just the, the sort of dilated uh, veins there. It feels like a bag of worms. Does anyone know what the second one might be? Quite red, quite swollen. Yeah, nice. And then uh, the third one. 
hydrosphere. Yeah, so this is basically, um, this is quite diagnostic. Well, this is diagnostic for hydrosphere. And then the last one's a bit ambiguous. <laughs> well, this was Pingu. Um, so the last one is an epididymal cyst. It's swollen at the top of the testes. Um, so that's just uh, just shows that you know it's not too obvious. Um, some patients might not notice it, but a testicular cancer could also present quite similarly. Um, and then this illustration here just shows you sort of how the the swelling might be. So hydrocele is quite diffuse. It's uh, separate from the testicle, a testicular mass. So potentially cancer embedded within the testes itself. Spermatocele or a cyst. Um, usually present at the top of the testes, uh, similar to the previous picture that I showed you. So on examination, this patient has no redness or diffuse swelling, um, non-transluminable, so it doesn't light up, um, and you can feel a hard discrete mass at the base of the left testicle, and there's nothing else of note. So given this history, um, what um, differentials are, what is your most likely diagnosis? Cancer, yeah. Brilliant. So this is what I'm trying to get at here. This is the sort of questions you might get asked in your OSCE in a history or an examination. Um, and then some other differentials this could be. Cysts, yeah. Nice. So I thought testicular cysts, spermatocele. So what investigations would you do for this patient? Ultrasound, yeah, nice. Anything else you might want to do? Urgent to wait. Tumor markers, yeah, nice. So a spermatocele is um, similar to a, um, a testicular, cyst, uh, testicular cyst. Yeah, you're in dip, nice. But I think uh, spermatocele is sort of like when you get sperm stasis. So once again, it's just a benign sort of testicular mass, whereas a cyst is just fluid collection. Yeah, so uh, testicular ultrasound is what you're going to do for this patient. FBC, CRP, just in case. Um, uh, there could be uh, underlying infection and serum markers, yeah, uh, pregnancy test, nice. Um, so the, the reason why I'm sort of emphasising this cancer over cyst is because um, you don't want to miss it, basically. So even though this is quite a benign sort of history, you, st you need to be thinking about this. It's, he's in the right sort of age group for it. Um, so management, um, we sort of said already, this patient needs to have an ultrasound. So patient counselling as well is quite important. Um, so in our OSCE, there was a patient who had potential bowel cancer. Um, and you sort of have to explain, you know, why you think this is a diagnosis, um, what's going to happen next in terms of investigations, etc. So it's quite important um, fact, factor to consider. And the serum markers are a bit more niche. Um, I wouldn't worry about them too much, but just be aware. OK, so we move on to the next SBA. Okay, so um, the correct answer to this one, so it, it, you guys are right, it's a testicular cancer. Um, but basically the way that I sort of remember this is that uh, testicular teratoma is the most common one in your teenage years and your 20s, so it's T's. Um, whereas uh, seminomas are more common, but they're more common in older men. Uh, so I say S for C now, which is a bit rude. Um, but the way I sort of remember it is T for 20s or teens. Um, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, but these are like the sort of like niche sort of questions that you could get. 
Um, but that's just a little aid memoir that I have. So we'll move on to the next case, which is renal stones. Uh, so we've got another SBA here. Yep, yeah, brilliant. OK, lovely stuff. So, yep, yeah, non-contrast CTKUB. This is something you need to know. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, basically, um, this will reveal, this is the gold standard investigation. Um, you'll be ordering these as F1s, and um, you need to know this for your SBAs and for your OSCE as well. So just make sure you know that fact. Uh, OK, so then we move on to another question. Yeah, nice. Another one of these things that you just need to know. Um, if this were sort of like an actual OSCE case, they could ask you uh, what your sort of first steps would be. I am Dick Lefenach, uh, CTKUB, and as I said, easily uh, SBA able. I don't, I think this might have come up as well in our SBA. Um, okay, nice. So move on to the next case. I've seen the most OSCEable stuff, stuff in neurology. I'll save that to the end if you've got time, because obviously we didn't get to do it, but we can have a discussion about it at the end. Um, okay, so 34-year-old 34 34 woman presents to ANU with severe loin to groin pain. So she describes sudden onset of severe pain that started around two hours ago on the left-hand side. It's colicky, and she feels very nauseous. She's got no past medical history, no drug, allergy, no drug allergies, or no relevant family history. Um, she's an investment banker, she's been very busy, very stressed, she's not eating and drinking properly, uh, she's got some bad smoking and drinking habits, and she's concerned that she's missing work and she shouldn't be in hospital, she's too busy. Uh, on examination, she uh, appears to be overweight, she's unable to lie still on the couch, she's got severe pain on palpation. So this is a sort of barn door classic case, she's got quite a lot of risk factors, um, she smokes, she doesn't... Uh, drink enough water, um, she's stressed, she's overweight. Um, so she's you know, quite high risk patient and she's got the classic presentation. She's unable to lie still, severe pain, colicky in nature. Okay, so what's the next best investigation in this case then? Urine dip, pregnancy test, yeah, any question with a woman of childbearing age, SBAs, I always back myself for a pregnancy test. Anyone with an acute abdomen, just do it. Um, it's, it has to be done, basically. Are there any other things that you'd like to do uh, for this lady? Pain relief, yeah, good. You're in dip, we've said. Use knees, nice. Okay. So um, urine dip, uh, make sure blood in the urine, identify any underlying infection. FBCs, we can see an inflammatory response there. Using these important one because um, if the stone has caused quite a severe blockage, you can get back up to the kidney and cause uh, renal impairment or AKI. Calcium and uric acid, a bit more niche. Um, just, to, you know, you're trying to rule out any metabolic cause like hypercalcemia, for example. And then, of course, the non-contrast CTKUB is the gold standard thing that you're going to do. 
So her results come back, pregnancy test negative, urine dip, showing some blood. She's got raised urea and creatinine, so we're going to be a bit worried this uh, lady might have an AKI and renal involvement. Uh, calcium and uric acid is normal, and then this is her CT. Uh, so does anyone um, have an idea what this is showing? Interpretation, impression? Yeah, hydronephrosis, nice. <clears throat> so this is something that could get thrown at you in an OSCE. It'd be really obvious, barn door. You wouldn't, you know, just go in blind or something like this. There'd be a brief history. Um, a bit of advice. I'd give because we had uh, imaging in our OSCE and you know when you're a bit stressed and uh, under pressure it's just take take a time just time to properly look at it look at everything don't just see something and think that's it I made a hash of one of the x-rays that we got given so it's just important to stay calm and take a proper look so impression as you said there's uh, hydronephrosis and there's a stone so there's a large renal stone in the left ureter and associated hydronephrosis. That's all you guys would be expected to know, I imagine. You wouldn't need to know any sort of anat anatomical landmarks or anything like that. If you can spot that, you're doing good. Um, okay, so what are you going to do now for this patient, given you've seen this? Nephrostomy, nice. Um, I'll sort of do the OSCE questions relating things at the end, if that's all right. Um, so not a stent interestingly at this point. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, you prescribe pain relief, you do clotting because you do have to do a nephrostomy and if she's a clotting factors are off for whatever reason, um, it's something you need to think about basically. And you want to admit and get urology involved urgently. She's quite unwell, she could become septic um, and she needs urgent decompression of the kidney. That's why a stent is not applicable here. You need to get a nephrostomy in and uh, drain that hydronephrosis basically. So as I've mentioned, nephrostomy. Okay, so another SVA here for you. Nephrostomy, yeah, definitive management for this patient. Yeah, nice. Well, in. so increase uh, oral intake and adequate analgesia. So um, this stone is basically quite small. I think five millimeters is the sort of cutoff um, for where you can start to think about conservative management. Um, this sort of stuff with the um, shockwave and percutaneous and uh, uteroscopy is a bit probably out of our remit, like just knowing the emergencies and when things aren't an emergency is probably quite important. Uh, but for sake of completeness and the fact it could come up in an SBA, I've just added it here. So emergency nephrostomy, we already spoke, it's in an emergency setting. If the patient's septic, severely unwell, or there's hydronephrosis, the shockwave uh, lithotripsy is used in a non-emergency setting. This is the one um, that you don't use in pregnant females. I've seen that on past med and stuff a few times. Uh, uteroscopy is a non-emergency one and you can use that in pregnant females uh, and you leave a stent in for four weeks. Um, percutaneous uh, nephrolithotomy, you're going in and taking it out, it's a bit more invasive. You wouldn't, um, you probably would try and avoid that if possible. But yeah, good to recognise that this wasn't uh, uh, as serious. Um, no, it doesn't mean they take it out, they just drain it. That'd be a nephrectomy when they take it out. All right, so I move on to uh, the um, next case, which is hematuria. Um, so another SBA.
Okay, so this question's a bit mean. I'm trying to illustrate a bit of a niche learning point just for the, the sake of completeness. But the correct answer to this is uh, antibiotics and follow up in two weeks. Um, so I'll explain this because I've seen there's a few more questions in the in the VBOX, but I'll, I'll just explain this and hopefully maybe uh, Eastwood or uh, Chris could uh, answer some of those just to give me a, a help and we move the lecture going. Um, but basically I'll explain this one. So um, yeah, this man is of age where you start worrying about uh, potential bladder cancer with Frank Hematuria. But the point I'm trying to sort of illustrate here for nuanced reasons, like just nicheness, is um, he doesn't warrant an urgent referral because the hematuria is not explained because he's got an underlying infection. So that's why the third one's correct, because you're going to treat this infection and then you're going to actively follow it up once it's cleared and ensure that there's no uh, residual hematuria. Then that would sort of warrant your sort of two week wait referral. Um, I don't think you'd get anything this hard. It would be sort of barn door, two week wait referral. But I'm just trying to get you guys thinking basically. Um, the antibiotics and safety net. So say safety net is good, like if he sees urine, uh, blood in his urine again and come back, but it just implies you're not actively checking. Um, so there could be some uh, underlying um, microscopic hematuria, for example. Um, but basically the, the referral criteria are um, uh, unexplained visible hematuria. Um, but yeah, two week wait is what you would do otherwise uh, if there were no other underlying sort of potential causes. But we'll go through a much more simpler case now. Um, so um, yeah, if there was much, so yeah, if he didn't have an underlying UTI, this would be straight away two week wait. Um, but basically, yeah. Um, okay. So we'll move on. So a 75 year old man presents his GP because he noticed some blood in his urine last week. He says it's no longer there, but his wife said he should see the doctor. So focus histories are things that seem to be increasingly common um, in OSCEs. Um, so they're sort of like a bit of a vague term and I still don't really fully understand like what exactly they want. You still kind of go through it all anyway. But for the sake of like just a bit of practice, um, are there any sort of, so basically the way I kind of tailor it is that you just specifically ask about this. Uh, so are there any sort of questions that you'd want to ask if this was given to you in an OSCE situation? Yeah, B symptoms good. Yeah, looks nice. What color is it mixed in or at the end? Nice, these are good niche questions, good stuff. Any clots, good. How many times, yeah. Painful or painless, nice. How long, good, good, good. Dysuria is good one, yeah, nice. Any other urinary symptoms? Yeah, brilliant stuff. Um, so yeah, much similar. Any sort of UTI symptoms? Has this ever happened before? Anticoagulation, nice. Yeah, good. Any medications? Um, yeah, so I see the focus history. Do you still have to do past medical history, etc.? I must admit, I still did it, yeah. Um, but I sort of tailored it to specific sort of like risk factors, maybe. I mean, you still ask about smoking, etc. I still would do it. Um, if you've got time 100% yeah that's why the focus history thing's a bit dumb but this is the way I sort of structured it in my head when I was doing them with the with the presenting complaint basically um but yeah nice so you guys basically thought the same as me um these are the sort of things that you want to be asking about so he says that he's had three or four episodes over two days the last two uh, last um last week uh, it's never happened before um he's got normal um the blood normal urinary habits oh besides the blood there's normal urinary habits um he hasn't noticed any there in the last uh last few days he feels well in himself but he thinks he might have lost a bit of weight he's never seen a urologist before and he's not started on any medications so this patient has hypertension uh, diabetes and af and he's anticoagulated with warfarin so the reason why i threw that in there is because um, this doesn't actually matter. Um, the the um, the amount of people presenting. It's basically the risk. Uh, the the hematuria is the same. If you're anticoagulating with warfarin, it doesn't really matter. Um, if someone's presenting with hematuria, um, their risk is still the same as those who aren't taking warfarin. So um, you wouldn't blame it on the warfarin, is what I'm saying basically. Um, 
you still want to investigate it fully. So he's not allergic to any medications. His father died of a stroke. His mother died of venous cell carcinoma. Uh, retired mechanic, lives at home, normally fit and well. He smokes. He's got quite an extensive smoking history. Um, but he isn't concerned as it's resolved. Um, so given that, what is your most um, likely uh, differential in this case? Um, yeah, bladder cancer, nice. Um, any other differentials you might be considering? Renal cancer, yeah, nice. Beetroot, <laughs> UTI, good, yeah, nice. Um, brilliant, yeah. Uh, prostate cancer or BPH as well. Yeah, these are all, well, the warfarin is something that you wouldn't blame it on, is what I was saying earlier. Um, Okay, brilliant. So good lift of differentials. Um, basically, why bladder cancer over renal cell cancer? Uh, bladder, uh, hematuria is bladder cancer until proven otherwise. Um, that's just the way it goes. Uh, what investigations would you want to do for this patient? Flexi-cystoscopy, nice, yeah. Why is the hematuria intermittent? I don't know, perhaps like it's just the way that it presents like um something might irritate uh the bladder one day and it might bleed might heal might bleed again i don't know it could present um constantly with uh, hematuria but i'm not sure sometimes it's microscopic as well it's not always frank just the way different patients present differently i guess so yeah um two week weight is the main thing here um you could do your analysis urine dip uh bloods etc um uh, if this were in the OSCE, these are all like reasonable things to do. Urinalysis to rule out any infection, bloods to look for any underlying anemia, using these to see if his kidney functions off for any reason. So his urinalysis comes back normal. Patient counselling once again to explain what the findings are suggestive of and explain the next step as well. And given his age and his risk factors, these are things that you'd want to put in there. Um, if you're sending someone for 2 weeks, so that's a good question. So in my uh final yoski with the 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 bowel cancer in my feedback so i was um i said uh, it's barn door like he's probably got a uh, bowel cancer two week weight referral he needs a uh, 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 colonoscopy and then i didn't really mention about other investigations and in my feedback i that got mentioned to me so it's important to still do these basic things as well just to rule out anything else um so I would encourage you to mention those as well. Um, also in our exams, we've got some crappy histology questions. Um, so I'm trying to include like, ob not obvious things, but common things that might get asked. So does anyone know what this is? Given the fact we're talking about cancers. Yeah, clear cell cancer, nice. Don't get too bogged down on this. Um, there are a couple of questions on it that have like, stupid histology pictures um the history will also help you and, and stuff but just so you've sort of seen it once then you know you won't forget um does anyone know what this might be uh not square myself how can you tell for the previous one i guess on the right hand side there you can see that the cells are just basically there's nothing inside them then they look pretty clear so i imagine it you know it, does what it says on the tin, basically. I'm not going to lie, I wouldn't particularly know myself. I just sort of got familiar with the images. So this second one is um, transitional cell. Uh, don't think they'll ask about that, but just it's there. You've seen it once. This one, though, um, does anyone know what this is? Yeah, and this keratin pearl. So the squamous cell, this came up in our finals again, they threw in this term. I had no idea what it was, um, but now you guys have heard of it. It's associated with uh, squamous cell carcinoma. It's one of those buzzwords. Um, and you can sort of see it here, like in, uh, where it's labeled. Don't read into it too much. It's just something that, you know, it's in the back of your mind now, you've heard it. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but it's just there in case. Um, okay, so move on to the next question. 
that they were all they were all bladder cancers, and the first one was obviously renal cell. Uh, okay, yeah, nice. This is one of those questions that I can't remember if it did come up once or twice or it's been t mentioned somewhere like a Moodle quiz, but it is a load of rubbish. Um, this is way above what we'd need to know, but it's just there in case you've seen, uh, just for, to make you aware. I've sort of explained it as well. So this patient basically has, um, you know, a low risk cancer. It's T1, so it's not met metastasized anywhere. Um, but I don't know how they deem it, the high risk of muscle invasion, but somehow they do. I guess maybe it's potentially close to the wall on imaging. Um, so basically, if the tumour is high risk, um, you can uh, add in an adjunct of this BCG immunotherapy. No idea how it works. I wouldn't recommend learning it. It's not worth it. They won't ask you about it. Um, but the distinction between the mitomycin C, they both can be used for adjuncts but mitomycin C is for lower risk. So I imagine if they do ask, they either wouldn't give both as an answer or they'd make a distinction that um, the, the cancer is of a high risk of invasion. Um, systemic chemotherapy, you don't need to give because there's no metastasis. Uh, radiotherapy, you don't use in bladder cancer. And cystectomy, cystectomy is the treatment if there were muscle invasion. Like I said to you guys last year, I wouldn't get too bogged down on these cancer managements. Just know that you know, if it's less aggressive um, uh, and there's no match, you can sort of treat it with a bit of surgery, remove the tumour. Whereas if, you know, it's aggressive and there's metastases, you're going to need some chemotherapy in there. OK, so we'll move on to uh, retention. So another SBA. Yeah, nice, easy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm a triplin. So uh, once again, just sort of be aware um, that drugs can also put patients into urinary, uh, urinary retention. Uh, amitriptylin, I remember the side effects of this as can't see, can't pee, can't shit, can't spit. Um, the sort of anticholinergic properties that it has. Um, and here are some of the common drugs that get asked about and their uh, side effects. Um, you can have a look at these in your own time. Um, but yeah, easy question. Nice, well done. OK, so move on to retention. Um, so in this case, a 73 year old man presents to A&E uh, with the inability to pass urine and abdominal pain. So what what is the most likely cause for this man, given his age? Yeah, BPH, nice. Uh, but other causes, uh, so neurological, quadriquina, for example, uh, obstructive, so like a stone, infections, UTIs can put patients into retention, drugs that we've mentioned, and post-operatively as well. So um, 
you have the lower urinary tract symptoms. Um, so what are the voiding symptoms that patients can get? Hesitancy, good. Yeah. Poor flow. Yeah, nice. Good. So yeah, weak or poor stream, straining, hesitancy, dribbling, feeling like their, uh, their bladder uh, isn't emptied properly. And then what are the sort of storage symptoms? Urgency, good. <laughs> frequency, yeah, nice. Yeah, good stuff. So the urgency, the frequency, nocturia, uh, the urge incontinence sort of picture. Good, nice. So on examination, um, what sort of stuff would you expect to find? Super pubic pain, good. Palpable bladder, yeah, nice. Yep, good. Enlarged prostate, brilliant. Always do a PR. So yeah, palpable bladder, abdominal tenderness, rectal exam, uh, find a smooth and enlarged prostate, so in keeping with BPH. So what investigations uh, would you want to do at this point? I mean, you can be thinking about prostate cancer as well, but BPH is far more common. PSA, bladder scan, catheterization. Um, yeah, so ideally you want to, you need to catheter to get some urine out if he's in uh, uh, retention, but um, basically bladder ultrasound is used to confirm the diagnosis. And then ideally the management is to catheterize this patient, um, as you've mentioned. Um, does anyone know any uh, complications of uh, when you catheterize a patient post uh, um, retention? Diuresis, yeah, nice. Post obstructive diuresis is what I was getting at. Um, so basically, um, once you relieve the obstruction, there's excessive water and salt loss. Uh, this can worsen any AKI they may be in. Uh, so basically, you just need to manage them with fluids and monitor use and ease. I had a look as to like why this happens, but the exact uh, sort of uh, cause is unclear um, and the mechanism seemed like way above what we'd need to know. But just be aware of it um, after after um, catheterization, this, this uh, post-obstructive diuresis can occur. So long-term management. So this patient uh, we've got managed acutely. Um, can we see the investigations quickly? Yeah, sure. So um, bladder ultrasound ultimately, but um, you want to look to see if there's any infection that um, could have caused his retention as well. Um, and using these just to identify whether or not his retention's caused an AKI. So long-term management of uh, BPH. Um, any ideas what you might offer this patient? Tamsulosin, finasteride, if not helping terp. Yep, nice. Um, first line is tamulosin, correct, because uh, that helps with the sort of immediate problem, whereas <clears throat> things like finasteride take a long time to work. So um, as we've spoken about, alpha blockers, tamulosin, um, important side effect though is hypotension. Um, so you need to be a bit wary if you're giving it to older patients. And the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, so things like finasteride, um, they take a lot longer to work. And then surgical management, as you said, so nice, easy stuff. You guys know your stuff. Um, okay, so another SBA, just to sort of uh, hammer home the learning point.
Okay. Um, nice. I'll just answer. So is there a reason not to get them to take both? Um, I think um, you can if it's like very severe uh, effect on quality of life. Um, there's a there's a type of questionnaire um, and I've forgotten its name. You guys might know. Um, but I think you try and get them on one first. Um, and then potentially the other one if that fails or if it's not helping as much. Uh, you don't sort of like want to do polypharmacy if you can avoid it. Uh, but the answer to this question is the um, uh, alpha sozin. So it's another alpha blocker, basically. Um, I was just trying to be tough for the sake of it. Um, but finasteride you could uh, use, but because he wants best relief of his symptoms, um, the alpha so the alfuzosin will be the one that does it quicker and uh, will relieve his symptoms um, more promptly, basically, is what I'm trying to emphasize. Um, so, yeah, as I was saying, uh, it takes longer for finasteride. It's technically second line. Um, doxazosin is used for hypertension. Uh, clonidine is an alpha agonist. Uh, Sidenafel is Viagra, not for the treat of, um, not for the treatment of BPH. But Basically, if you guys know that you give alpha blockers and 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitors, you guys are doing well. And TERP is a surgical management. Uh, so we'll move on to prostate cancer. We're coming towards the, I think, the last few cases now. Um, so we'll start with an SBA. Yeah, nice. Uh, very well done, everyone. I'll just have a look at some of these questions. So was an alpha flow in risk hypertension 85-year-old man? Um, yeah, it could do. Um, I can't remember how old I made him. Um, but uh, there was no other suggestion uh, that, you know, he was at risk of that. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that too much unless they explicitly mentioned it. Um, is there anything special about alpha flow in opposed to tamilosin? No, it was just a different name. Um, Tamilosin, I think, is the one they use more commonly. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was sure doxazosin was used in BPH. Um, it might be. Um, you guys probably know more uh, than I do, but um, tamilosin is just far more common, and you wouldn't. I don't think you'd. Um, I think doxazosin is just more associated with hypertension. Um, what is the dose of DEX? It's eight milligrams BD. Uh, but anyway, a, uh, arrange urgent whole spine MRI and prescribe DEX. So this is something you guys need to basically know, uh, but the vast majority of you got it right. Um, so as I mentioned, this is an emergency. You should be able to recognize this then. There should be no delay whatsoever. Um, you need a whole spine uh, because the neurosurgeons are just, um, you know, they want to see the entire thing before they're going in and operating. Um, DEX is the most important thing here, so you need to get that done before bleeping because they're just going to tell you to do it anyway. And as I mentioned, you need a whole spine. But good stuff. Okay, Bill. So we move on to the, uh, the prostate cancer case. Um, so a 78 year old man of African Caribbean origin presents his GP with difficulty passing urine. Um, oh, no, never mind. Um, focus history taking skills uh, relating to prostate cancer. So I've mentioned here. Your sort of lurks problems relating to urinating, any erectile dysfunction, bone pain, because it classically metastasizes to the bones, weight loss, is there a family history, smoking um, uh, can increase your risk. So this gentleman, um, he's noticed over the last few months his stream's getting worse, uh, finds it hard to start the stream, there's no blood, no pain, he's got some nocturia and he's had a bit of weight loss as well. So his past medical history, uh, nothing too interesting, something you'd expect from a gentleman of his age. Um, father died of a heart attack, mother died of lung cancer. His older brother recently has been diagnosed with prostate cancer. 
Um, so he used to smoke quite a lot. Uh, he's recently cut down, lives at home with his wife. He, he, this patient's worried that he may have prostate cancer like his brother, but wants to be tested for this. So what are the sort of next best steps you'd want to do in this patient? PSA, anything else you might want to do before that? Yeah, good thinking. Prostate exam. Is P so explain PSA isn't a good test. Yeah, I'm going to get onto that later. Nice. Um, he was quite old. He was in his 70s. Um, so prostate examination and urine dip. Nice. Good stuff. So we've mentioned those. Um, so on examination, it's hard, irregular and craggy, opposed to the sort of smooth enlargement in BPH. And the urine dip was normal. So PSA testing. Um, so the patient says he wants a test for prostate cancer. Uh, does he need it in this case? Two week weight referral. Um, no, so he doesn't need it in this case. Correct. So it's due to the, the DRE finding. Uh, he basically warrants a two week weight referral anyway. So um, as I've mentioned, yeah, doesn't need it. Um, because he's got an abnormal DRE. So um, are there any other factors that can cause a, um, a raised PSA? Yeah, uh, is it good to have a, a baseline for treatment response? Uh, yeah, I, I don't uh, argue with that, but just in, in terms of like the, 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 the I mean, in reality, you would do it, but for the sake of the sort of strict criteria and if they ask in an SBA or in an OSCE, like ideally he doesn't particularly need it for a prostate cancer diagnosis. Um, but yeah, you guys are right. Yeah, and I've just sort of missed all this stuff. Recent invent intervention, UTI, ejaculation. Yeah, recent DR, uh, DRE, vigorous exercise. Yeah, good stuff. Anal sex, not joking. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Uh, so yeah. Uh, mentioned all those here um, and as someone mentioned as well like the, the PSA test so this is something that you might have to explain in an OSCE potentially um, that you know that the test isn't that good it's 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 sensitivity and specificity um, isn't that good um, you know lots of people have a high PSA and get investigated for prostate cancer and they don't have it um, okay so next question I think someone's mentioned the answer to this in the 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 chat. Yeah, nice. So this has become the sort of uh, gold uh, gold standard investigation, multiparametric MRI, um, something to be aware of. Um, I've seen it asked and I've been asked about it on my urology placement as well. Um, so just an, uh, something you need to know. Um, OK, so what options do we have in terms of management for patients with prostate cancer? Active surveillance, yeah, good. Yeah, removal. Yeah, brachy, nice. Radiotherapy, terp. Radiotherapy, good. Yeah, the the um, GnRH antagonist and agonist. Good, good, nice. So, um, as I've mentioned before, um, I wouldn't you know know too much about like Gleasons and. Uh, stage in, just no like low score, good, high score, bad, basically. And you know, as you can appreciate, the as the, you know the the 
the cancer is more advanced and metastasized, you're going to need more intensive treatment. So yeah, if it's localized, active monitoring and watchful waiting is used, especially if the patient's older um, and you know they don't have many symptoms. Uh, removal, radiotherapy, um, you localize ones, you can use your hormonal therapies, removal, and if there's meta metastatic antiandrogen and synthetic GnRH antagonists. I wouldn't really know much more than that, to be honest. Um, but these questions are just a bit more challenging for the sake of it, but uh, the principles are basically the same. Yeah, TERP is BPH. Why did I say you can use it for cancer? What is the difference? Yeah, nice, good stuff. Um, robotically assisted, purely because it's a better option now. There's fewer complications, shorter recovery time. But ideally, yeah, this guy, he's got a, quite an aggressive cancer um, and um, there's no Mets. So you want to get rid of it, basically. Um, and yeah, the robotically assisted ways is just the best option these days. Um, there's a question about... <laughs> is robotic available nationally? I have no idea, I'm afraid. Um, so that sort of concludes. Basically, I didn't know any more than that for fifth year. Um, so that's sort of the level that I knew, and I think that got me through quite comfortably. And I imagine in the OSCEs, it would be sort of similar level to that. Um, so, you know, just to sort of ease any anxiety. Uh, or um, any concerns. I feel like that's quite a good level for you guys. I know a lot of people want to know everything and quite all the niche, uh, you know, the niche and extra stuff, but that's basically the level that I sort of revised for fifth year. Um, obviously, it's a bit bare bones presentation, but it's more just to get you guys thinking and a sort of understanding of what you guys should be looking at. Um, so, this niche slash UCL SBA section is a bit, bit rubbish, in, in my opinion, because I don't remember there being any hard UCL SBAs or any niche ones, which I think is a good thing, because uh, you tend to remember those harder ones. But I've tried to devise a few just to test a few learning points, so don't get too beat up over these. But one of, I think one of one or two are quite useful, so we'll crack on with those. Yeah, nice. Um, it's one of those that you either know it or you don't. Um, but, you know, you still love this garbage. Um, yeah, so that's a staghorn uh, calculus there. Um, Proteus is associated with it. You know that now, or you already knew it, to be fair. Um, cool. How much? I'll answer that question at the end. Um, OK, this question came up in the urology section. Oh, 
Isaac loves a good rim job. Nice. Okay, a bit of a split. Um, this one's a bit tough. So this is Kalman's. Um, I, I don't really know too much about this stuff, but um, hypogonadism could come up in um, in neurology. Um, but basically, so it's not primary because um, that would suggest there's an issue at the test at uh, the, the testicle. So he'd have high LH and FSH trying to stimulate it, um, but he's got low in this case. Um, Kalman syndrome is basically uh, the neurons up in the hypothalamus aren't working. So it's hypogonadotropic hypogonism. So there's just nothing there, stimulate, not even to stimulate the testes. Um, nice. And then Kleinfelter's classically, you'd get like the tall, uh, the tall, the tall, the above average height sort of patient. Um, high, uh, and Kalman's also, they'd mention like loss of smell. Um, Androgen sensitivity syndrome is a sort of primary end, end, aminuria, end organ resistance, testosterone. These are all very niche. I didn't really learn these, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, also, I'm just learning for onc in general. Uh, I'll go over that at the end. Gynecomastia, because it's just an opposed estrogen. Uh, a okay, so I think yeah, this one is uh, one of those uh, little niche points that is probably worth knowing. Uh, the reason why it's not uh, Gerstlin on its own is because you can't give an agonist on its own, especially when it's um, very close to uh, the spinal cord. Um, so um, because you get that sort of transient rise at the start, it increases the tumor size, and that could potentially uh, press on the uh, the core uh, on the cord so the best option here would be uh, degragulix which is a uh, uh, an antagonist uh, this would reduce his testosterone levels and therefore lower his disease activity um, as I said an agonist on its own um, can cause a transient increase in activity I wouldn't deep these questions too much I kind of just put them together at the end for a bit of a challenge um, just something to be aware of um, but that basically concludes the presentation. Uh, da, da, da. Um, the uh, GNRH. Um, I'll just have a look back. So there was a question about um, oncology. Basically, the answer to every oncology question you'll get is dexamethasone. Uh, but I basically just learned the emergencies. Um, yeah, so if there are any questions that I've not answered or um, that you're unsure about, uh, just send them back up to the top. Uh, and if you could uh, leave some feedback about this format, that'd be really handy. 
Um, I, I don't know if you preferred this way or the old way, but let me know. Um, how much hematuria do we need to know? Um, I don't quite know what you mean. Um, potentially, just basically two week wait. Any unexplained hematuria? That's sort of the extent to I would know it. Um, that's the most important thing, like the former. Um, is fourth year cancer stuff not worth revising? Um, I personally wouldn't bother. Like, I just know that oncology emergencies from this year. I think that's the key thing that they ask about. Um, why was ED a key question to ask? Um, I guess it's, 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 a, it's a side effect of prostate cancer or the, the nerves are all located around there because you can damage it when you remove it. So potentially if it's uh, a tumour's grown, it can potentially damage the nerves that, uh, that uh, cause an erection, I guess. Um, right, so there's a few questions about these ones. Um, right, what's going off? But if hypogonadotrophic is an all hormone, the hormone levels low. Um, I'm not going to lie, I can't really remember the ins and outs of the physiology about this question. Um, but basically, um, yeah, I think it just particularly targets these ones in Kalsman syndrome. So it would be the, the FSH and LH. Um, that's why, uh, and you lose the sense of smell. So that would help you differentiate between that and Kleinfelter's. Um, but Kleinfelter's is primary hypogonadism. Um, so you'd have high LFA, LH and, and low, uh, high LH and high FSH. That's another way you can distinguish between the two. It's not that there's a high level of estrogen. Um, it's just an opposed. So like men do have estrogen circling around, but because there's no testosterone, no testosterone, that's why he's presenting with the gynecomastia. Is common secondary or tertiary? Ugh. I'm not sure, to be honest, you might want to double check that. I think it's tertiary. I don't know. I probably I never learned that. I wouldn't go into that far detail. Uh, I think you can give either agonist slash antagonist and rely on negative feedback after transit rise. Yeah, so you can give both. Um, I think people have answered the questions that, that I'm about the agonist. Um, so basically, I'll go explain this again. So um, basically, you can you can't give an agonist on its own because you're going to get a transient rise in the in the um, testosterone that sort of fueling the cancer and then it'll make it grow and then um, it'll press on the spine. Normally you would give um, gersolin. Um, normally you would give it and you'd give an antiandrogen. If the answer had an antiandrogen in it as well, then that would be correct. But it was just a tough question for the sake of it. Um, they don't normally give the the um, the antagonists. They're not re as readily available. Very like niche. Call. Like the main thing is the 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 GnRH uh, agonist is what you would give, but it causes a transient increase. So you need to just give an antiandrogen to cover. That's what I'd sort of take away from this. Age of testicular tumors. Um, um, so basically, I learned that as uh, teratomas occur in the teens and your the 20s, they're the ones that happen in younger patients. So it's just two T's, but it's just the T's, teratoma, teens, 20s. And then uh, seminomas are more uh, common and more aggressive, but they occur in older patients. Senile, S for senile. Uh, you wouldn't do a pregnancy test, right? I think I remember seeing this on Grey's Anatomy. This guy had a massive sort of uh, uh, teratoma and he was doing a pregnancy test and it was positive. I mean, I guess in theory it would work. Yes, teratoma peak 25, seminoma peak 35. But yeah, it'd be blood HCG. Uh, are there any other burning questions? Sorry, I, I don't particularly, I don't, learn these sort of last three things in much detail it's not something you know you should be particularly worried about it was just to sort of emphasize like niche learning points 
Oscar Bull Urology. Yeah, that's a tough question. Obviously, we didn't get to do it. Um, so I'm not sure. I feel like a history potentially could be something. Um, even the ABCDE, I don't know, but like uh, acute retention, but it wouldn't be enough or unicolic maybe. Um, it could come up in some of these integrated stations that they like. You guys got a bit confused about stones management. Yeah, your retention and then a catheterization could be a station. Yeah, um, a bit confused about stones management. Um, so basically, if someone's coming in with a stone and they've got hydronephrosis or they're very unwell, you're going to do a nephrostomy to alleviate that uh, uh, build up uh, uh, the fluid back up into the kidney and try and help the, the AKI resolve. So you drain it straight away. Um, if it's really small, so like less than five millimeters, um, then they tend to like allow them to pass on their own, um, give them some analgesia and encourage fluid uh, intake so they can tend to pass on their own. And then it sort of gets a bit more tricky in the middle. So this slide hopefully can give you some um, explanation. So the shockwave one, and the urotoscopy, it depends on the availability, I guess, in terms of normal people and how big the stone is and where it is and, you know, what they prefer. Like, you know, urotoscopy is a bit more invasive and, you know, you're leaving a stent in for four weeks. Ideally, you wouldn't be making that decision. Um, I think the th main thing to know is that a shockwave isn't ideal for a pregnant lady, whereas a urotoscopy is what they use in pregnant females. Does that sort of clear it up? I don't think you need to know more than that. The, the, when do you choose a stent? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a urologist. Um, I guess one, if they're pregnant, um, I guess it depends on the size of the stone as well. I mean, perhaps bigger stones, you might want to stent it. Or if they've got multiple stones or they've got increased risk of forming stones again. Um, whereas shockwave, um, if it's a smaller stone or there's lots of little stones that you want to break up, I, I don't I don't particularly know the, the answer to that and I don't think you would be expected to know it either. What were your final OSCE stations? Oh, I don't really want to revisit that. Um, there was a lot of. Um, there was cardio rest, neuro exam, which was lower uh, upper limb sensory. Um, what else were there? Uh, there was like explain a, a, a paper, like a research paper. Uh, G, um, God, I can't remember. A fluid sort of assessment and management post-op, suturing, um, some weird uh, preeclampsia, A, B, C, D, E. What constitutes a severely unwell for renal retention? Um, I guess if they're septic, um, if they've been like aneuric for quite a long time. Um, basically, these patients can, if they've got an underlying infection, they can become uh, septic. Yeah, suturing. So we have to take a history, suture them and prescribe. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, if there's any other burning issues or any questions about this presentation, please just message me on Facebook or email me. Um, but yeah, and let me know if the format erectile dysfunction management. Nah, uh, I wouldn't. I don't. I just, uh, Viagra. Uh, have you? Uh, lot uh, nice. Some good chat throughout this presentation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good. Uh, keeps keeps it a bit lighthearted. Would you suggest learning neuro exams for year five OSCEs? Oh, I honestly don't know. Probably not. Um, not unless they've said they're going to test some fourth year stuff, but I doubt it since you've got finals. Do we need to know any emergency doses? Probably just the PRED. Uh, the DEX, sorry. The DEX for um, for the uh, sort of cord compression. Right, I'm going to tap out because I'm absolutely cream crackered. But thank you guys for coming.
Um, and if there are any other questions, just message me and 